Howdy, everybody. I'm Jonas Lamas, and this is going to be the story of Pal Payasam. So on your next trip to India, you might want to take a detour to a town called Ambalapuza. Ambalapuza is in the southern Kerala state, and it's famous for two things. Rice pudding, or Pal Payasam, and it's Sri Krishna Temple. Now the legend goes that this guy, the Lord Krishna, made a visit to the city there and challenged the king of the realm to a game of chess. They decided that the reward for winning the game would be a couple handfuls of rice. In fact, they decided to use the chessboard as the method of parsing out that reward. They'd put one grain of rice on the first square and two on the second, four on the third, eight on the fourth, and so forth and so on, doubling every square of the 64 squares of the chessboard. Well, they played their game, and as you can imagine, the king lost, and he called forth for some rice to be brought forward, and he started parsing it out, one and two and four and eight, and by the time he got to the 20th square, he had to put a million grains of rice on the 20th square. And by the time he got to the 40th square, he had to put a trillion grains of rice on the 40th square. And if he had kept going all the way to the 64 squares of the chessboard, he would have had to put 18 billion billion grains of rice. That's 460 billion tons of rice. That's more rice than is in all of India. Well, the sage revealed his true identity and told the king that he didn't have to pay off the reward right then, but instead he could pay it off over time. And that's why they still serve pal payasam, or rice pudding, in the temples of India. Now, I think that the uh, Lord Krishna had another gambit up his sleeve back in 1965 when he visited this guy. This is Gordon Moore, and in 1965, he wrote his article, which turned into Moore's Law. Now, simply stated, Moore's Law says the number of transistors on a semiconductor is going to double, just like those chess squares, every iteration, every 18 months to two years. Intel's architecture is a great example of this. In 1981, the I-8088 had about 29,000 semiconductors, while the current version, the Penryn, has about 820 million semiconductors, or transistors. And the next generation that's coming out, 2 billion transistors on it. Now, what do you do with 2 billion transistors? Well, you do stuff that was unheard of a decade ago. We do video conferencing and virtual reality, and we mash up stuff, and we do our own home movies and things like that. My parents' generation, that was pure science fiction. But you know what? It's going to keep going. Scientists believe they have another 10 or 20 doublings out there over the next, you know, next 20 to 40 years. And what's going to happen when you know the iPhone you've got here in your pocket is a million times more powerful than it is today. Well, as Apple says, there's an app for that. It, uh, you know, 20 years from now, that app is actually going to be called the Brain, right? But before we talk about putting your brain inside of your iPhone, we'll talk about what IBM was doing. So IBM has a lab in Switzerland called the Blue Brain Project. And the Blue Brain has about uh, a supercomputer that has about 8,000 of the latest and greatest chips in it. And they actually built this Blue Brain project to simulate the human brain. But they started with something a little smaller. They started a couple years ago with the fruit fly. And in fact, they're focused on the neocortical column, about a 10,000 neuron subsection of the fruit fly brain with about 20 million synaptic connections. They have this really cool robot, and it potentially takes these microscopic slices of this neocortical column. They, they probe it with electricity to see how the neurons interact. They capture that information and put it in the blue brain. And when they finished those 10,000 neurons and they turned on the simulation, it started thinking just like the fruit fly does. Right? So they captured that brain and they put it inside the computer. So now they're scaling up at IBM and they're trying to do a human brain. Well, that's going to take 500 petabytes of data. That's about 200 times what Google has in all its servers. But it's also what a $1,000 laptop is going to give you in about 10 to 12 years from now. Right? So what happens when we have these computers that potentially are smarter than humans Right? 10 years from now? Well, uh, Ray Kurzweil uh, calls it the singularity. Some of you might have heard that term. Others, others have called it the rapture of the nerds, right? But there's a real possibility that in 10 years from now or 100 years from now, we're going to have these super smart machines that think more logically and a lot faster than humans do. And who knows what's going to happen then? It could be utopia. It could be the end of humanity. 
I like to think back to that movie War Games, right? You know, we started with a game of chess, we're going to end, it, end with it. So at War Games, they ask, would you like to play a game of chess? It's something that we all have to think about. Thank you.